Hello everybody, my name is Rabbi Moshe Miller from KabbalahDecoded.com. Be sure to check us out at our website. This is going to be the first in a series, an introductory series, to the concepts and ideas of Kabbalah. There will be short videos, 10 to 15 minutes each approximately. And um, they will go through all of the basic tenets and ideas of Kabbalah. But first, just a little bit of history. Kabbalah really began with the creation of man, Adam, who was created in the divine image and was endowed with natural wisdom. He was given the ability to name all of the creatures, as we find told in the story of Rishit in uh, Genesis, uh, that he gave names to all of the creatures. This demanded, in fact, a tremendous wisdom, because the names that he gave them were the names of their true essence, a picture, essentially, of what they were in their inner dimensions. Later on, uh, there was another great figure named Hanoch or Enoch, of whom it says that he walked with God and was no longer, he became an angel. He was also endowed with tremendous natural wisdom. And um, because of the state of corruption of the world, he could no longer uh, remain and he, so to speak, left the world, was taken up to the heavens and became, a, um, became an angel. Noah was an inheritor of this divine wisdom, and he in fact used it to be able to illuminate the ark in um, the very dark times in which he traveled. There are those Kabbalistic explanations that explain that the ark, or for the word in Hebrew is teva, the teva, the ark, or literally means word, that he is methodology, so to speak, his uh, ability to survive the flood which flooded the world was his ability to enter into the Word. In other words, enter into the words, the, he, the Holy Hebrew words, which was his manner of survival, and he was able to take with him all the life forms which existed at that time. After the time of the flood, even though the purpose of the flood was to cleanse the earth of um, the terrible qualities which were exhibited by the people in the time of Noah, nevertheless, after that time, there was still the power of the dark arts that were known to um, many people, amongst them Nimrod and the builders of the Tower of Babel. And they, in fact, used these dark arts to do what it is that they, uh, that they did, essentially rebelling against the authority of God, against the kingdom of God. Later on, Abraham um, was a very proficient in the secret wisdom of, essentially, Kabbalah, and he wrote probably the first book, Although Adam himself also wrote a book called Raziel Hamalach, Raziel, the angel Raziel, the, the angel who guards the secrets. Abraham, which a book which is extant and which we have today, Abraham wrote a much more approachable work called the Sefer Yitzira, the Book of Formations, in which he recorded the divine wisdom, the natural divine wisdom which had come down to him and with uh, which he had been granted. And... He also sent all types of wisdom. It says he sent gifts of natural wisdom to the East. He sent gifts to the East, and our sages tell us that this was natural wisdom, wisdom which is the inner dimension of the worlds in which we live. I will explain that later on further. The next generation, Isaac, the son of Abraham, Yitzhak, was given some of the secrets of prayer and meditation in particular, and Jacob, his son, was given the secrets of birur. Birur means essentially rectification, or to use the um, more uh, technical term, disencumbering the sparks of holiness. Well, things continued um, right throughout their time in Egypt. Uh, Joseph was also, in fact, an accomplished spiritual guide. 
until the time of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, who was the most accomplished um, man of knowledge, the most accomplished person of knowledge of all types, knowledge on all levels. He was given the Torah, the scripture, the Bible, along with the rest of the Jewish people in the year 2448 in the Hebrew calendar. That's more than three and a half thousand years ago. And from there, um, the teachings, including Kabbalistic teachings, were spread out right through the generations. In fact, there are four levels of interpretation of the Torah that were given to Moses at the time and sort of codified into the Torah, and the Torah can be understood on all four of these levels. The first level is called Pshat, the simple, straightforward explanation, which is usually the explanation that uh, requires us to act in a certain way or not, uh, not act in other ways. In other words, it limits our actual visible behavior. It also limits, to a certain extent, our thinking and speaking. Um, in other words, it's a code of law. And the simple interpretation, which comes to us through the stories and through the commandments uh, that are present in the Torah, is called the Pershat level, the simple, straightforward, literal, literal level of explanation of the Torah. Next comes a higher level of explanation, which is called Remez. Remez means things that are hinted at, but not necessarily explained. I'll give you an example. One of the methodologies of Remez is to hint to three things through a numerical connection. So, for example, the word for hand, for hand in Hebrew, is yad, yud, dalad, yud, dalad. So then the numerical value of the word, each letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. And the numerical value of the word yad in Hebrew is 14, which corresponds to the 14 sections of the hand. There are four fingers with three sections each, and then the thumb has two sections, that's 12 plus two, which equals 14, and therefore the word yad actually hints to the very nature of the hand and what it is that it does and is has been created to do. That's called remes, where things are hinted at but not necessarily explained in depth. The next level of, uh, of explanation of the Torah is called the drush or drash, which is the sort of homiletical explanation, uh, the explanation which you will get when you hear a sermon. That's usually some kind of um, form of drash where a person is taught good qualities of character and good types of behavior. Uh, over and above what is required by Torah law. Ways to think about things, ways to act towards things, um, the regulation and expansion, enhancement of feelings like love and fear, uh, love, love and fear of the Creator, love of our fellow man, uh, respect, and so on and so forth. All of those are contained in the section of the Torah called Drush, Drush. The final section of the Torah is called Sod, the secret teachings of the Torah. And this is really where Kabbalah belongs. Kabbalah is another word for Sod, Sod, the secrets of the Torah. Now, the word Kabbalah itself really means the received tradition. But it also means, it also comes from the word Hakbalah. Hakbalah means paralleling, to parallel things, because Anything that appears on a lower plane of existence, in other words, a more visible plane of existence, the one we live on, and I'll explain planes of existence in a subsequent uh, video, there are actually five different planes of existence which are spoken about in the Kabbalah. But in any event, from the most visible plane of existence is paralleled by a deeper plane of existence, and that's paralleled by an even deeper plane of existence. And so it goes on, there are uh, planes of existence um, in five different levels, and uh, in a sense, these actually correspond to the four levels of interpretation, and then the latest development of sword of the secrets of the Torah of Kabbalah, which is called Hasidic thinking, Hasidism, 
or for those that are not used to pronouncing the ch sound, Hasidism. So pshat would correspond to the lowest level, to the most visible level, rem is to a more, a deeper level, and eventually we get to sod and Hasidism, which are the deepest levels of the Torah and correspond to higher planes of existence. So those were all revealed and codified and given to Moses at the time that he was given the Torah and that he shared the Torah with the Jewish people. These teachings were then transmitted to Joshua and all the prophets right throughout the generations and eventually through to the Talmudic sages. One of the famous Talmudic sages, Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana, 1st, 2nd century, wrote a very important work called the Sefer HaBahir, the Sefer HaBahir, and also the Sefer HaPliya. Those two important works um, were produced in 1st, 2nd century, and then eventually we come to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, also a 2nd century Tana, a 2nd century sage, uh, also known as the Rajbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who's uh, passing is commemorated on Lagba Omer. You may have seen that with uh, lighting bonfires, etc., etc. We will discuss that in a later class. And he was the author of the Zohar, the famous Kabbalistic work, the, the really the Bible of Kabbalah in a sense, which is called the Zohar. Um, we know that there are um, various academics who um, believe that the uh, Zohar was produced in the 13th century. I have a whole series of academic articles on this, uh, easy to read, but nevertheless academically sound with all the references, which you can find at kabbalahonline.org, kabbalahonline.org. You can spell Kabbalah with an H or without an H, kabbalahonline.org, one, uh, one word. Just look for my name, Moshe Miller, or even better, look for the series of articles called Authenticity of the Zohar. Authenticity of the Zohar, five articles which discuss the um, the origins and the authenticity of the Zohar, as the title suggests. Now, the next video will be three eras of Kabbalah, the three eras of Kabbalah, beginning with the Zohar and ending with Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, then the Arizal, and then the time of the Baal Shem Tov. Be sure to listen to the next video coming up, and also be sure to visit kabbaladecoded.com for a schedule of our live classes and the same website, kabbaladecoded, one word, dot com. For personal counseling and coaching, you can also make a complimentary first appointment over there. Nice to see you, and I hope I see you again in the next video. Thank you very much for attending.